All right, MediaWiki.org. So if you're not familiar with MediaWiki, it's essentially the same software that runs Wikipedia itself. Uh, Wikipedia's got a lot more customization, but the concept is the same. It's a wiki. It's very easy to learn, very easy to use the markup language in it. And once you add a couple tools to it, it actually becomes a very great documentation server. Uh, it's well, part of the problem with documentation is if you don't make it easy to use or you create too many barriers in getting information uh, both into a system or back out to people, that people don't do it. And that's one of the concepts in uh, MediaWiki that I really liked is it becomes a very simple way to create data and put all the data in one place and then easily change that data as needed and keep track of all the versions and who did what in that data. That is a massive undertaking and uh, Wikipedia scales really, really well and has done a great job of handling that. Now this is the current version that we're running here in April of 2017 or 2018, which is the uh, 1.3.0 uh, MediaWiki. The 1.3.1 is supposed to be out in June, but everything's gonna be based around that. Now, part of the reason I delayed doing this video was until I had a VM ready for you. And I say that because uh, there's a lot of tricks to setting it up and I wanted to make it a little bit easier so you can just jump in and start playing with it. So I'm gonna provide you a VM and a VM is uh, spec'd out like this. It's called the Wiki. Uh, it's set to DHCP. Uh, it's got one gig of RAM, 256 gig virtual hard drive. It's gonna be your standard uh, OVA format so you can import it to VirtualBox or whatever hypervisor you want. I said VirtualBox because I'm actually exporting out of that because I figure that's the most common one, uh, but it works fine. You can import it into Zen or whichever other hypervisor you wanna try it with. Uh, root, password 123. It will allow SSH uh, login from root because I have that turned on. So those are things you may wanna lock down if you plan to use this in any type of secure environment. The way we run ours, very locked down. None of these uh, services are exposed. It's on a separate network. And we're gonna cover a little bit more of the lockdown in just a second here. Something else for ease of use for people who, like I said, wanna get started playing, I loaded Webmin on this. And if you're not familiar with Webmin, you're gonna find it on port 10,000. So because it sets a DHCP, the IP address it picked up was dot 47. Uh, you can log in and type uh, IP ADDR and it's gonna tell you what IP address it got. And like I said, root and password one, two, three. Now for the users on here, we have an admin user in the wiki and uh, the password is password. And then we have a uh, Tom user, and I made the password Thomas123. So those are all the users that are in here. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Zoom these in so we can read them real quick. But they'll be in the little bit of instructions in the download link uh, for this. So that way you can download this uh, file, get playing with it, load this in your own VM, and start playing with the wiki. It's pretty cool. And Webmin, I know some people hate it. I, we don't use it in production, but it's kind of an easy way for you to play around and poke around with the servers and a MySQL database server that's in here so you can kind of see it. Like I guess it's a great, I think it's a great learning tool uh, for some things or occasionally just to figure out, you know, how some of this stuff works. Please note, it says two package updates available. Do not use Webmin because it will break the package updater uh, because there's a couple caveats here. The visual editor is what a lot of people want installed because it makes editing the wiki really easy. The visual editor relies on Parsoid. Parsoid has a new version, and normally that's exciting, but the Parsoid version is not compatible with the wiki visual editor version needed to run on version 1.3. So there's some incompatibilities because of the new updates. That being said, there's a workaround where you pin the Parsoid version to an old version. They have instructions on how to do that. I believe it's in the discussion here. Um, so when you're following through all this, if you wanna build this yourself, there's a lot of details that you have to kind of read and assemble. There's not really any guide for putting it together and it's actually rather difficult um, unless you're savvy at Linux putting it together. And I did not have time to make an entire step-by-step -step guide video on how to build it. Um, and all this is gonna change in a couple months anyways. Maybe after it changes to the new version, I'll look at doing that. For now, I provide you with a VM that works. <laughs> That's uh, And you can reverse engineer anything you want from the VM that works uh, or just use it and customize it yourself. That being said, um, let's get started on how the MediaWiki itself works. Like I said, all these, I'll leave links, but I mean, it's tons of documentation on here and discussion of how to set all this up. If you're Linux savvy, you can follow and build it on, on your own VM. So. First thing is we customize this to be a private wiki. That's one of the things about this. It's not just wide open to the public. And uh, that's important because even though we keep it on a separate network, uh, we do not expose this to the internet. It's locked down, turned off, and not easily available or easily accessible. And when it is, 
a login, we have two-factor turned on. So the two-factor keeps anyone from just logging in, even if they did have username and password. We also built it on encrypted drives. This VM was not built on encrypted drive, basically for your convenience. That way there's not one more barrier to setting it up. But I highly recommend building the VMs on encrypted drives and locking it down in a separate network if you plan to put any private data in this. Wikis are made for sharing. You just may not want to share it with everybody. So we have an ACL list that only allows specific computers in this building to access it. Once it's past the ECL list, it's username, password, and then a token, a two-factor token, and we have persistent login turned off. So once they close their browser, it deletes the, it will not let them stay logged in. So it forces them to be logged out. A couple other plugins we have. Let's cover them real quick here. We have the OAuth extension, that's the two-factor one, and user page viewer and visual editor. And you can see all the little customizations for visual editor that are in here. We also have a um, WG file extensions. This allows you to save more than just images into the wiki, which by default only wants to allow images to be saved. They don't allow XML files and things like that. We modified this so it allows it to do config files. So if you back up a firewall and you want to save your data from a firewall config or whatever into the wiki, you can do that. And I'll show you how that works as well. It's, it's actually very convenient. All right, so let's get that out of the way. So what you want to do is log in, and it's not going to present me with two-factor because I don't have it turned on for there, but it's super easy to do. So here's the main page. Like I said, very little here. Uh, you can look at recent changes, which I uploaded some uh, stuff and played with a few things. The wiki is wonderful at tracking all the details of what happened. So let's take a look, and we'll start with the client page, and then we'll work backwards to how we built it. So here's the Pied Piper client. And... This is kind of a template we use, and I'll, I can throw a copy of this template. It's really easy to kind of add some structure, but clients become somewhat unstructured because every client's different. So we start with like a base structure, but every client, there's a bunch of little things that you have to do to kind of, you know, add details to how their systems are set up. So it also is flexible. So when we say template, it's not like it's locked in form fills, it's general starting forms. Now you may have noticed by default, everything starts collapsed. That's part of the convenience in keeping things clean so we can expand this. And then you have people's, you know, uh, email addresses in here, maybe a company directory, server login stuff, printers and scanners that they have scattered around the office, the Wi-Fi login information. Now, you may notice some of these have hyperlinks. Now, this is part of the actually how we do things in production. We have hyperlinks. For example, this is a Dell R520, and it doesn't go to a real one, but it's close. I made, I made it the service tag one digit different. And what this would actually do is links you right to the service tag page. That's one of the advantages with the wiki is you can link to all kinds of external data like that so you can have everything at your fingertips. This is linked to our Screen Connect system. It's gonna ask me to log in because I'm in a different browser logged out, but it would actually open in Screen Connect, a remote control tool, directly to that server. So this is some of the, you know, uh, how you service things fast. You can pull up the client information. I have everything I need to log in. I even have the direct link to their client file, to their Screen Connect file, so we can get in. And the same thing goes here. Uh, the Wi-Fi demos, we have it, uh, this will bring me right to our Unify page login. I can log right in, it lands me on that client, I can start managing their Wi-Fi. So if they're already managed on there, and that's what some of these do, let me go to edit real quick. Because I'll actually say, yeah, it says Wi-Fi, yes. These little summaries at the top tells whether or not, we, do we manage that client's Wi-Fi? It's, we have a multitude, we're not a managed service only, and we're not a break fix only. So these kind of help us determine if a client calls us, because we have about 300 clients we do IT for, what the basis is for those clients. You know, whether they're a managed client, unmanaged client, what we manage, what we don't manage. Do they have a camera system uh, that we need to know about, and do we manage it is actually uh, how this goes. It's, this doesn't actually mean for, in terms of us, whether or not they have cameras, whether or not we have cameras that we manage. This where a client summary comes in. Now, once you go into edit, nothing's collapsed, and you can edit everything. And this, because the visual editor is in here, this is what it looks like if you view from source. Standard wiki markup language. Back to the visual editor. Visual editor makes things really easy because we can just do this, insert another row, add another user. Yep, put the number in there. I like keep the dashes. Let 
no, no cell phone in there, and then double click this. And save changes, confirm the changes, away you go. Now I've added something to here. Now this is important because what this is doing is making it very easy just to edit and change data when you need to get things in and out of the system. And you may be wondering, how do we change, view the history of that? Or let's actually uh, do a password change. So we did that change, but let's do a password change. So we'll go over here. Oh, we gotta edit, get in edit mode. Uh, from what Wi-Fi? That Wi-Fi. Save. Yep. Your change was saved. If we look at recent changes, this is a global version of recent changes. We can see there was a change history here, or we can click on the thing itself and we can go to view history. This will allow you to compare the changes. And right there is going to highlight just what was changed then. And we know between this and this, I'd added another person to this. And we know who did it. We can revert to it. We can view that page as it looked then. This is actually a kind of cool thing. So not only can you undo it, you can even view that version of the page. So here's the version there. Here's the version there. So this is the version where the Wi-Fi is. Let's see where it go. That Wi-Fi. Let's look at the version from 10.05. and it was what Wi-Fi. So this is some of the nice thing about it. It's gonna track each user that did it. So admin had made some changes at 847. This is me prepping for the video. So this is what it looked like when admin was doing it. And then we go all the way to the beginning and this is what it looked like probably with, yeah, no information in it. This is what it very first looked like when admin created the page. So wikis will track in detail every little piece, everyone who touched everything. Now, this is also where the user tracker comes in. We go over here to the special pages, user page view tracker, and we can see everything that Tom touched or admin user, only two users in here. Now, in our production one, it's got all of our users in here. I know every page that anyone looked at and it's constantly done. This can't be deleted. Matter of fact, you can't delete anything in the wiki permanently. By default, or the way this is configured, it can't be done. So if you go here, and we're gonna go back over to our Pied Piper, which put a search. And I'm a malicious person, so let me just go here. I'll go right to the source. Delete, save. All right, that's hosed. Now, if we go over here, pull up Pied Piper again, we'll even log out. We'll log in as admin user. It'll bug you to change the password because it's the initial password I set. We'll pull up Pied Piper. Nothing in here, but I can go to view history. And we can see, wow, he deleted 4,000 lines. So let's go to this one. Well, there's everything. Uh, let's go ahead and undo this. Oh, conflicting the intermediates, my bad. We'll just undo this one. There we go. There, it's restored right back to the way it was. Like I said, it's really easy to, one, see what anyone touched, see what anyone changed, see every version history. I have no limits on these. I mean, there's ways you, as an admin you can purge things out, but by default, users cannot. And when you're creating the users, you just create them all as what they refer to as bureaucrats, which allow them to uh, go through and you know, create pages and edit pages and see things. But you can also create all kinds of restrictive groups if you want. So we're going to special grades, special pages, create accounts and this is you go through you create the account you know whoever you're creating whatever you want to do here create the account it's been created and then you go over here back to special pages users and rights and then you can then remove the credentials rename the user reset their password reset their tokens block them if you wanted to or go to user rights Bob load the user, actually I put the username in there, and then you can now grant 
the different reasons in here. Now, I'm not going to get into every option to customize this. There's plenty of documentation here, but you can create all the group rights, the groups, and then assign things to those groups and what permissions they have. You can get really in depth with here so you can control what people see in there or only give them access to see what you want. So that's definitely an important part of it. So let's jump back into because there's all kinds of fun things you can do in here, um, but that's all well documented through MediaWiki. They their documentation is very extensive on all the features. So let's talk about clients. Let's talk about creating new clients. ABC client, for example. So if we want to create ABC client, all I did was first I searched for it, cannot find it, so you hit create, and it'll create the client. Now by default it wants to create from source, so our starting point is the template. And I can leave this template, I'll leave a copy of this as well. So we'll create the client here. Oh, first time, so it wants me to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't run the tour. All I did was paste in the tape. We're going to save, save. And that quickly, I created a template. Now, you can actually make this faster by creating templates in there that will dump this in based on a command. Uh, it's it's fine to do that. We actually created a uh, file called template. <laughs> and there, like I said, there's other ways to do this. You can create template. And then you can just copy and paste from this template from source to every new client. So it's actually really quick to create stuff. So our ABC client. Uh, recent changes. Yeah, ABC. Make sure I had it right. Whoops. Page title match. Uh, the autocomplete does work. It takes a second because it rebuilds the index. Uh, but it once you've created a client, you've edited it a couple times, the index is rebuilt and they auto find like Pied Piper does, how it auto completes. By the way, something, and I've never bothered, I think there's a way to turn this off. Uh, the search indexes are built uh, case sensitive. So if you typed in Pied Piper with a lower P, it doesn't necessarily find it. I haven't found it this time. It's a way, there's an index rebuild that fixes that. It's not that big of a deal. Anyways, so let's look at our ABC. Yeah, ABC client, hey, it's auto-completing now. So if I type in, hey, look, ABC client comes up. All right, perfect, it, index is rebuilt. <laughs> um, so here it's working and this is all basic. So there's no data in this client or anything like that, but it gets you the idea that you can now start editing it and start filling in everything and putting in there. Now, side note, and I'll, I'll pull this up real quick because this is kind of novel, is the ability to do this. This is just a uh, stock ticker that works in Google Sheets. And please note there's some links and there's some uh, things going on in here. So it's got all these different formulas, but we're just gonna go ahead and do a copy, your standard copy paste, control C, bring it over to here, find the spot we wanna drop that in. It really doesn't matter, paste. You can paste in different spreadsheets. This should work fine from Excel. Don't have Excel to even test it, uh, but it works fine from Google Sheets, and I've tested it with uh, Open Office, and it works with that as well. But yeah, you, if you have a lot of data already tabulated and things that are in spreadsheets you want to get in here, you can copy and paste it. You can also copy and paste uh, Wikipedia information. So if you had something you've seen you wanted to pull out of standard Wikipedia for building your own documentation, Let's grab some data like this. And there we go. We've now pulled in a big pile of information on there, and you can start editing it. Uh, it understands when you copy and paste from Wikipedia, dropping things in from there. So if you wanted to use Wikipedia as some of your documentation source, which sometimes happens, sometimes you have some technical things in here, because we don't just save client data, we save sometimes our own work instructions and build instructions for things, and we'll pull data from different places and we compile it here for a work instruction, maybe how to set something up um, when there's a lot of detail and I need to save it somewhere. So that's kind of showing you how to build a client and all the customization you can do it. So let's go back over to our Pied Piper client. I'll show you a few of the things we have in there. So we're going to leave page because I'm not going to save it. Um, this is a network map of my network that I drew a while back in one of my other, I think it's my virtual lab video. So that I uploaded to here. And we'll talk in a second about uploading files. Uh, the other thing we do a lot of is like the work instructions. So, you know, per work instructions, purge data from old server, uh, update the offline updater, set up 
the time software. This is actually, uh, you may even recognize it as time management. We have a few law firms that use it, and this is like the, for one of them, this is the work instruction for it. I didn't bother putting all the screenshots in here, but we can do that. But it's also whenever there's a change to work instruction, this comes back to the data has to be easy to edit, easy to use. So some work instruction for CAS, I was actually letting my wife play with the wiki server when she was messing with it. So if there's a step three, and we realized that we needed to be of another step in there, so we can just do this, some, that other thing needs to be done before, and then we hit save changes. What this allows us to do, and we've done this before, you know, you're editing a work instruction, you realize something got left out. Well, if you made the system really difficult to use and you couldn't just click edit and change it, you would never update the documentation. You go, I'll do it later. I don't feel like doing this and this. This is one of the reasons I like the wiki so much because that quickly I added another step and dropped something in here. Let's say I wanted to add another work instruction as well. So we can actually just edit this section of the work instructions here. And the way you create them, you have subheading one. So this is a heading and this is a sub uh, set as subheading two. So we just change the same thing, subheading two. Another, whoops. Another work instruction. And then we're going to go ahead and use the uh, numbered list. You know, this first, this second. And of course, you could elaborate on this and insert files and things like that. Most of the time, work instructions are, you know, step step here, step here, do this, do this. Um, they're not always as visual as they are just process and procedure to follow. And save changes. Save. Now, what's really cool at the very top here, here's the work instructions. And this is why we do these subheadings on these. So you have the headings and then different subheadings. It automatically generates the contents on the fly. So some of our clients, there's a lot of this. There's a, just a massive amount of all the different things. Now, by doing this, and we do so much of our work remotely, we'll have this open in one window when we're doing the work. And this is how we're just on the fly creating work instructions thing. That way, if another staff member needs to access that client, they know the work instruction, how to complete whatever task is done there. If something gets changed, we change it right away on there. And this is part of documentation. If you don't make it easy for your end users in your office to use, use, they won't. They will go, um, it's too much trouble to update, it's too much trouble to do this. So part of the process is, you know, we log in, we have this, we go through the two-factor, it's only certain people on the list, so it's very locked down. But by making this really easy to use, when a client calls, one, we have easy access to the information. Two, if that information changes, it's super easy to just click edit and just start editing the information of whatever changed. You know, for things like hosting, for things like uh, their logins, we have it all right there with one click. We can put all the hyperlinks to the different pages. As you know, if you worked in IT, unless you work in a single vertical, every client's very, very different. So it's something to think about to making sure you have all of that. All right, now it's a little tricky getting the media and the quickest way to do it uh, when you're uploading a file is edit source, insert media. We're gonna go to upload, select file. And we got the Piper firewall here. So we'll go ahead and open it. It does make, you can probably take that off if you want to play with the code, but it does make you upload your own work. Uh, backed up firewall of firewall for changes on. All right, so we hit save. You can say use this image. insert, then you just take out the thumbnail part. If you don't take it out, it doesn't do anything anyways, uh, but we'll do this. Now we have the files here, so we're gonna hit save changes. So it's a little bit weird, but there's the firewall config, uh, Piper firewall config, and it says, when was this uploaded? Now let's say you go and make some more changes to that. So we're gonna go ahead, whoops. We don't need to do this again. Once you've created the placeholder for it, actually, we're going to put a breaking space in between here. So, Also, the visual editor doesn't like the files. That's why I always go to edit source. So edit source, I believe we just need to put a, uh, a space between there. And now they're separated. So the two separate files, so you can clearly see what they are. Now, if you want to update this file, we're gonna go ahead, and we don't need to delete it. We're gonna upload a new version of it though. Browse, 
There's the Piper Firewall. I actually just made a quick change to it. Some change made. Upload file. Now there's different versions of the file. This is actually really handy, so you can keep a history of all their firewall configs. You can delete them if you want. This will let you purge, but once again, you can if you delete them, they can be undeleted. Uh, so you can now see and make comments for each version you uploaded, what those changes were to that file. So if you ever updated a bunch of firewall rules, but then you go, man, I needed that config version from a month ago when we last changed it. This is why I really like the way the wiki handles files. So the placeholder doesn't change because the file name doesn't change. We just keep uploading over again and it keeps all the different versions of the file. That is just super handy because uh, you had the version history of the file and you can look at it. Now I think, um, will it let me do this? It doesn't understand the difference in there. Yeah, there's probably ways you could do uh, some comparison of the files in terms of if they're XML and look at them. But most of the time you're uploading, you know, if the firewall saves in XML, some of them uh, save in proprietary weird formats. So there's another issue there. So it doesn't let you really do a diff inside the file. And like I said, you also have to, mod the Viggy's already been modified, but something we changed was allowing upload of files that are not just image files on there. So let's go back to our Pied Piper client. And of course you always are probably wondering a question. So here's the other file. What if we deleted it? Yep. Let's just delete that. And the file's been deleted. Now, when you delete the file, and we're going to open up more than one window here to make it easier, it's still here. It just lets you know it's been deleted. But it's going to bring you back if you want to view and restore. And like I said, nothing's really deleted unless you run a purge, um, which by default, the admin users, I think only the admin users can do it. And there's a special way you have to do it. I believe through it from the command line too. Um, there's the normal users can't purge this, but we can view and restore these files just by going back here and go, okay, here's the file history and go ahead and restore it. So reason for restore, I didn't give one, but if you've seen that right there, it asked me if there was a reason to restore it, and you can type, I restored it because someone accidentally deleted it. Now if we go back over to Pied Piper, there's that file, per back perfectly fine. So they can delete, but the delete doesn't technically go away, it just goes into the, you deleted this. And like I said, unless you purge it out, it's still there. So this is kind of the overview of how we use the wiki. Um, you can look at all kinds of stuff. You can look at like recent changes if you want to keep an eye on uh, what people are doing inside of it, what changes have been made. It's really slick for doing so much of this. It's also kind of fun because you can customize things. Like, let me go to the main page here. You can even customize this. So we're going to source and let's go ahead and delete that and make the main page. We're gonna delete this too. Save changes, save. And now the main page itself, when you first log in, becomes this, all the uh, recent changes. Or you could go in here. So special recent changes slash 50. Another option would be, I think you can do uh, special There, and I said all pages, and now what it's actually doing is as each new client comes up, it lists all your clients here. So let's go ahead and add another client, oops. So we do that, go ahead. I'm not gonna fill in a template, save. We go back to the main page. Now we have ABC client, another client, main page. And you can see how you could have the main page and landing. Like I said, you, there's a ton of things you can do with wikis. There's a ton of information out there on how to customize them. But this is just a general how we use the wiki uh, for managing all kinds of documents. So if we have a lot, it's a great information repository for us uh, for all kinds of things. Uh, we even have you know links to things we buy usually, vendor links, uh, just all that data for your company. Rather than trying to have just a, massive mess of Word and Excel documents that you have saved everywhere that, oh man, someone opened this file or did someone edit this? Having it all in one web interface 
is very convenient. Matter of fact, I even suggest for companies, even if you're not using it for client management, just in general, consolidating all your company information to a wiki Great idea, and a lot of clients have actually done this. They run their own internal wiki servers. Or Confluence, if you're looking for a commercial version, uh, Confluence is a very similar piece of software. It runs a very similar way uh, of keeping all your documentation somewhere. Uh, but it's I'm really a big fan of the media wiki. Scalability-wise, it's the same as Wikipedia for the most part, so yes, it scales very well. It's a great tool. Um, I'll leave the instructions and link for downloading the VM so you can you know, play around with it yourself. And you know, maybe if you not even want to use it for the client stuff, if you just want to use it just for creating your own personal document repository just to have all your personal data somewhere, when you you know come up with something, come up with a thing, you're like, hey, I just want to document and write stuff on here, uh, but make it easily accessible, they're really good for that too. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click the thumbs up. Leave us some feedback below to let us know any details, what you like and didn't like as well, because we love hearing the feedback, or if you just want to say thanks, leave a comment. If you want to be notified of new videos as they come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe and the bell icon. That lets YouTube know that you're interested in notifications. Hopefully they send them, <laughs> as we've learned with YouTube. Anyways, if you want to contract us for consulting services, you go ahead and hit lawrencesystems.com and you can reach out to us for all the projects that we can do and help you. We work with a lot of uh, small businesses, IT companies, even some large companies, and you can farm different work out to us or just hire us as a consultant to help design your network. Also, if you want to help the channel in other ways, we have a Patreon. We have affiliate links. You'll find them in the description. You'll also find recommendations to other affiliate links and things you can sign up for on lawrencesystems.com. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.